Well, Northside, last Sunday, 1,832 people celebrated the resurrection of Jesus with us. It was just a, a powerful Sunday. Todd Willis sharing his story, his testimony of how, man, he was on a path either to death or to Jesus and how Jesus brought him life. And just all of that just had a tremendous impact last week. We, we got to celebrate after, after our last service last week. A, a gal was baptized last week. Of course, Logan today, just the impact of that. We heard several other stories from people who, man, friends came or they were just impacted by that story from Todd and what he shared. And we're just celebrating what God did. And not only that, but as Jessica mentioned, eight, 15000 $850 going towards our Easter offering, which is three projects on three different continents. And I just want you to know this is the last week to give to that. So if you want to give, you can do that you know, online. You can do it through the memo line of your check or even in one of the envelopes in the boxes as you leave today to give to that great work to North Africa, to India, and to Maranatha Bible Camp, as you were just hearing about from Penny and Corey. We're just excited about the work. And then we were excited last week to kick off this new series through the book of Psalms. And we're just looking at the Psalms to see that we can have hope in the face of fill in the blank. And last week, hope in the face of death. We saw from Psalm 22 how as Jesus was on the cross quoting from that Psalm, it, it gave him a voice in his suffering, fed his faith when he was struggling, and allowed him to come to the end where he could say, it is finished, God has done it, he's done it. And we just got to see hope, what it looks like in the face of death. And every single person in this room and that's listening right now, you need hope in the face of death. We need that. But today, I want to talk about hope in the face of weariness. Hope in the face of weariness. Is anybody tired today? Worn out today? You feel it deep in your bones. You're just mentally, spiritually, emotionally, relate. you're just worn out. You're tired. Are you willing to admit it? Somebody probably asked you today, how are you doing? And you said, busy, but good. And you really meant exhausted. That's what you really meant. You just didn't say it. Kind of like the, the family a couple years ago, they were worshiping. And they were singing the, the chorus. Maybe you remember this song. It was, I exalt thee. That goes, I exalt thee. I exalt thee. And uh, as this mom was singing that song, her uh, family was with her, and her, her little girl was standing on the seat beside her. She uh, couldn't really read the lyrics yet to that point, but she was just singing along at the top of her lungs. She even had her hand raised, and her mom leaned, stopped singing and leaned down to listen because she's like, What's she saying? And she was singing, I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted. And that little girl was probably speaking more truth, right, than most anybody in that moment. We're just worn out. We're tired. We're exhausted. Man, we've been feeling this in our home. I know for the past several weeks, month, whatever, the pace of home life and and school activities in full swing, Owens in baseball season, Maddie in her spring season, two upcoming graduations, uh, my son's wedding this next month, spiritual warfare, the weight of dealing with emotional pain and events in people's lives. And I mean, we could just go on, but yeah, we could use a little hope in the face of weariness. And I would imagine for a lot of you, you could use it too. And we just want easy fixes. You know, we're, we're just like, man, is there an app for that? This weariness that we're feeling? No, there's no app for that. But, you know, I think there is a psalm for that. I think there's a psalm for that. It's Psalm chapter 6. In fact, if you have a Bible or device, you might want to open up to it. Psalm chapter 6, because the psalms are a collection of hymns and songs, poetic in nature. But like nearly 50 of the psalms are what we call psalms of lament. That's the core category. That's a third of all the psalms. Of the 150 psalms, nearly 50 of them are psalms of lament, where people would cry out, to God in prayer. They would complain to God in prayer. They, they would grieve to God in their prayers. They weren't romanticizing the world. They weren't pretending like they were living in some fairy tale land. They understood that where we live, you, you get both bad and good. You experience lon loneliness as, as well as fellowship, that you experience disease along with health. Anxiety, as well as peace. Sorrow, 
intermingled with joy, weariness, as well as rest. I, I mean, this is what we experience. It's not all sweetness. It's not all roses and, and light. And these psalms of lament, they express people's agony and their frustrations. And it's only that kind of faith that, that when we acknowledge that it might be in crisis, only then can it be reaffirmed and strengthened. And Psalm chapter 6 is just one of many psalms where this happens. David is writing this psalm. He composes it. And I want us to look at, the, at what David laments, what he says. So in Psalm chapter 6, beginning of verse 1, David says, Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. As, you, as we read through this psalm, you can just hear his weariness that he's experiencing. But I want you to notice what Diedrich Bonhoeffer noticed and what he says about this psalm. He, he just says, in these psalms of lament, there's no quick and easy resignation to suffering. Now, Diedrich Bonhoeffer is also the one that was speaking out against the Nazis during the Holocaust and ended up losing his life because of it. So he knew suffering. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer says there's always struggle, anxiety, doubt, even in the deepest hopelessness, though. God alone remains the one addressed. What he points out about this psalm is that, that David is bringing his lament to the Lord. He's bringing it to God. He's addressing him and, and, and him alone in this moment. And we're going to talk more about that later, about how we bring our laments to the Lord. But the way it starts matters. And then David goes on. He says, my soul is in deep anguish. How long, Lord? How long? Turn, Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. Among the dead, no one proclaims your name. Who praises you from the grave? I'm worn out from all my groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. Away from me, all you who do evil, for the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies will be overwhelmed with shame and anguish. They will turn back and suddenly be put to shame. Look, we don't know exactly why David is lamenting or what's going on in his life at this time. It's, it's not exact science here at all. But we do know this. His body is racked in agony and pain. He feels it in his bones. He's worn out. He's weeping. His eyes are weak. He's filled with sorrow. He's facing foes and opposition. He's concerned that he might be going to the grave. He feels weak. He even describes his soul as being in anguish. What he's showing is that our suffering affects our whole of experience. Suffering rarely affects just one part of your life. It affects many aspects of it. Your relationships affect your attitude towards yourself and even your attitude towards God. The psalmist saw the pain that he was going through is affecting not just him individually, but to a broader sense, even his social dimension. In this case, his enemies, as well as a theological dimension, his relationship with God. Even today, we we know, it's recognized that theology, psychology, sociology, they're all interrelated. What we're saying is this, is that suffering in one area causes suffering in others. That's why sometimes when we go to a counselor, they help us see areas maybe we hadn't even thought of that are affecting our current reality because suffering in one area causes suffering in other areas as well. And David, he's just facing intense weariness in multiple areas of his life. Yet in this psalm, somehow he's able to go from, Lord, Lord, how long, which is how he starts, to the Lord has heard me. He's accepted my prayer. And it, and it seems to happen so quick. And, and in a moment, we're going to look at how that transition happened. How did he go from here over to here and seem to do it so quickly? And yet what happens in him is the same thing that happened to Jesus, even from the, the cross, Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me too? It's finished. It's done. The Psalms of Lament will help do this for us. Many of them do. And my prayer is that you too can experience the same transition that David went through, that Jesus went through. Because I know you're either in a season of weariness or you're going to enter into a season of weariness. And Psalm 6 can, can help you have hope in the face of your weariness. 
So how do you do it? How do you experience it? Here it is. Number one, let's start with some things we see in Psalm 6. Number one, it is good to lament your weariness. It is good to lament your weariness. I don't know that most of my life I would have necessarily thought or said that. Like when someone's really lamenting and complaining and exp- expressing their frustrations and their anger, sometimes I'm like, you know, hey, let's gain some perspective here. You know, let's, let's uh, try to be more positive. And... But the Psalms of lament are the largest category of Psalms. These Psalms where people cry out to God with their sorrow, their grief, their complaints, their questions, their frustrations. And in these psalms of lament, you see them give complaints against God, complaints against their enemies, and even complaints against themselves. Psalm 22 last week had all three. But they're expressing their complaints to the Lord. Now, who they're expressing it to matters, but they're getting it out. They're expressing the reason that they're so upset and hurting. Sandra Van Opstel said, Lament orients our hearts toward only what God can do. This is why it's good to lament. To lament orients our hearts to what only God can do. Our natural American mindset is not to lean in towards lament. We don't do that. We try to avoid it. We've even discouraged people from sharing their frustrations and their hurt and their anger. But God provided lament as a way to help us, that it is good for us to cry out to God, expressing these things that are on our hearts, things that only God can actually do something about. Now, we don't do this well. And I think one of the reasons we don't do it well is because, you know, we, we don't want to get stuck in lament. We, we want to be He-Man. You know, we, we want to be, have that superhuman, superhero power. Like when I was growing up, it was like, like I wanted to be, you want to be the master of your universe. I mean, that's what we want. And that's what He-Man was. The master of the universe. We want that kind of strength. We want that kind of power, that kind of resolve. We don't want to show weakness. And when you lament, it feels like weakness. We don't want to do that. But I'm here to tell you today, Even He-Man lamented. You didn't know that, did you? Even He-Man lamented. I'm going to prove it to you right now. It's biblical. It's in Psalm chapter 88. Psalm 88, you can go there. You can read the pericopes right there. It's a mascal of He-Man. That's what Psalm 88 is. It's a mascal of He-Man. Now, some people probably pronounce it Haman because there's no hyphen, but I'm telling you, it's He-Man. It's He-Man. And uh, spelled, you know, spelled the same, H-E-A-M-A-N, just missing a little hyphen. So even He-Man, I want you to listen to He-Man right now in Scripture. Here it is. This is what he said. And I'm just going to, this is a portion of Psalm 88. He-Man said, my life is full of troubles, and I'm nearly dead. I'm like a man with no strength. You have taken my friends away from me and have made them hate me. My eyes are weak from crying. Lord, I've prayed to you every day. I've called out to you for help. Lord, why do you reject me? Why do you hide from me? I've been weak and dying since I was young. You've taken away my loved ones and friends. Darkness is my only friend. He, man, was weary, okay? When he was writing this, this is what he looked like. This was he, man. This is what was going on in his life. Even he, man, was lamenting the weariness The agony, the pain, the frustration. He was upset, angry, confused, hurting. Even He-Man needed help from God. And not just this He-Man, but virtually every hero of faith that we know of biblically had these moments of agony and hurt and confusion and frustration and pain, and they take the lament to God. They express it to Him. We normally try to avoid lamenting. Like we, we don't want to feel the pain, and so we try to numb it. We numb it with medication or drugs or alcohol or ice cream or food or something else. We use entertainment to distract from it. We don't, we don't want to go through it. We want to suppress it. None of that's healthy. But if we don't acknowledge it sooner than later, we're going to end up at the end of ourselves Jordan Rice, he's a church planter in Harlem at Renaissance Church. He's, he's regional director for the Orchard Group. And he was talking about how he actually schedules time in his calendar, time during his week to lament, to 
lament the hurt, the losses, the pain, the frustrations? How many of you, I mean, this is the first day of the week. We're starting our week, right? I'm sure some of you are going to have a calendar meeting later tonight. How many of you, you already know that you've, you wrote into your calendar for this week, the week of April 16th, um, lament, some time to lament? How many of you scheduled that, right? Like, I, I haven't yet either, uh, but I'm going to. I'm going to do what Jordan says, because Jordan says that he schedules a time to lament. He says, normally what he does is he sets it for 10 minutes. He's like, I'm not going to wallow in it. I'm not just going to wallow in lament, but I also want it to be long enough I can actually identify the things that are angering and frustrating and hurtful, the wounds, the losses. He's, he's going to emotionally lament. Because this is not when the logical Jordan shows up. This is when the emotional Jordan shows up. And I, I lament these things to the Lord and grieve those losses, that there is something good and helpful and healing that comes in that process because then he can take those things to God. So he enters into that moment, sharing those with the Lord, dealing with them emotionally, and grieving them, which is biblical. A third of our Psalms are doing this. David would encourage you to do this. Jesus even said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Comfort is on the back side. Jordan Rice went on to say this. He says, we can't envision a new reality without grieving the present one. We're not going to envision a new one if we're not grieving the present reality that we're in right now. This is why lament is needed. So lamenting our weariness is good. It's good to lament your weariness. Here's the second thing. It's also good to identify the cause. And David lists quite the cause of his weariness. It's, 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 a lot of it's there. But there is a good reason to identify the cause of it. And I don't know what is causing your weariness. I'm going to try to hit on three possibilities right now. I think one of those causes could be this. Are you weary because of relentless hurry and busyness? Is that why you're weary? Are you, are you weary because of the relentless pace that you're keeping? I mean, there's a healthy kind of busyness when your life is full of the things that matter, not wasted on empty leisure and trivial pursuits. But the, the problem is not that perhaps our, our life is full or we have a lot to do. Maybe, maybe that's not. It's that we have too much to do. And we pack on things that we were never intended to put on. It's when you have too much to do and the only way to keep up with that quota is to hurry and to rush. We grow weary because of our relentless pace. Michael Zigarelli from the Charleston Southern University School of Business, he conducted what he called obstacles to growth, obstacles to spiritual growth. He surveyed over 20,000 Christians across the globe and just identified the major obstacles to spiritual life. And one of the things that he proposed in his hypothesis was this, is that Christians are assimilating to a culture of busyness, hurry, overload, that's how we're living our lives. And I think many of you could shake your head yes on that. He said, because of that, God is becoming more marginalized in our Christian lives. Because of that, it's leading to a deteriorating relationship with God. And because of that, it leads to Christians becoming even more vulnerable to adopting secular assumptions and on how to live which leads to more conformity to the culture of busyness, hurry, and overload, which just increases with speed the cycle they're already going through until we have drifted away from the Lord. John Mark Comer says there, there, may be a t there is a time for hurry. It's, like, it's not like that you would never hurry. You know, if your pregnant wife, if her water breaks, that'd be a good time to hurry towards delivery and help participate in, in helping with that. But he says, let's be honest, that's not the kind of hurry we typically are in. He says, the pathological busyness that most of us live with is our default setting. It's chronic hurry that we assume is normal. Well, it's far more pathological, as in the technical sort, a pathogen let loose in the mass population that's resulting in disease or death. This is the result of it. And when we live with hurry, we grow mentally lethargic and numb and uncreative and distracted and restless and our emotional unhealth becomes our new normal. Irritability, anger, cynicism, 
and its twin sarcasm overwhelm our defenses and take control of our dispositions and we get tired and worn out and our immune systems start to falter. It's like our nervous systems are trying to get our attention, yet we push on until inevitably we crash. Can any of you identify with that? I mean, I can. I can just look back over the last month. And if I were to say, you know, emotionally, Wayne, what, where have you been at? Um, irritable, angry, cynicism, sarcasm. I mean, it starts to tell us some things that's going on inside that need to change. Weariness. And it can crash. In fact, uh, he goes on to say this in the Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. He says, if we do not rest, it's like what one person said, Sabbath is coming for you, whether as delight or discipline. Like Sabbath is coming, rest is coming, either as delight, we delight it, or as discipline. You're going to crash and burn. You'll be forced to. And that's why God has commanded the Sabbath. You would think that the command of God that tells us, I command you to rest, like that that would be well received. It'd be kind of like this afternoon God saying, I command you to eat ice cream. I like that commandment. But why, we, why do we not like the commandment of, of rest? Because instead, we have something in our human condition that just says, we got to hurry our way through life as fast as we possibly can and rebel against the limitations of time itself and Due to our immaturity and dysfunction and addictions, God has commanded against all of that that we rest. We do something life-giving, but we rebel against it, and we are in a rush and a hurry and the pace of our life, and I've been feeling it lately because we, do, we, also, we live in a culture of more, more and more, a culture of unquenchable lust for everything, lust for more food and drink and clothes, more devices, more apps, more things, more square footage, more experiences, more stamps on the passport, more. That could be the cause of your weariness. And if it is, there's some things that need to change. Why do you feel tired today? Why do you feel worn out today? Maybe it's this. Could it be that you're in a relentless pursuit of acceptance and approval? Because that will wear you out. Do you feel burdened to perform to such a degree in such a way so that people will approve of you or accept you or admire you and so you sacrifice life and free time and health and family and that which is good? Dr. Alan Algram, he served for 29 years as a pastor of Rocky Mountain Christian Church and he wrote a book called Soul Strength. And in his book, he just talks about his struggle with acceptance and approval. And he said in the early years of his church, when he was doing ministry, he says he, he was afraid when someone would call the house if he was home in the evenings because he felt guilty, like, he, like they would think he should be out working or doing something or calling on a family. This is back when, you know, you, you actually got the phone off the wall and, and said hello. So you, you had to be home when you answered it. And he said he felt that early on, that the stress of that, that he should be doing something. He felt it all the time. And then years ago, he, he, he got a special award. And, and with the special award, he got a gift. And the gift was made of marble and crystal. I mean, this was a nice gift. But the gift was an image. It was the image of a man pushing a boulder up a steep hill. That's what he received. Many of you recall the Greek myth of Sisyphus and how he was condemned to pushing a boulder up this mountain, up this steep hill, and every time he got near the top, the boulder would come rolling all the way back down, and he would just have to do it again and again, over and over. And Alan Ogram just said, man, that's how I felt. Like I just kept having to push this heavy load. It was relentless. He could not relax. He had to keep pushing. He couldn't stop. And he says some of that probably even goes back to growing up. He grew up in a Christian home where his dad was in a job that he feared he, he might lose. And things were tight in the family. And his mom, who dealt with a little bit of anxiety, was afraid of, of her husband losing the job. He said, I just grew up in this high, an air of high anxiety in my home. But the message that he internalized was he could never worry enough, he could never work enough, he could never truly cease or stop or relax. And it was just this boulder, this unrelentless pressure to perform that Alan was up against. And because of that, he could constantly do it, 
But the, and, and then when things got really hard, he would just start blaming people in his life. He said, I blame my wife. I, I blame the friends closest to him because they weren't supportive enough, helpful enough. You know, whenever we're doing something that's extremely unhealthy and they're not like supporting our unhealthiness, we get mad about it. And he did too. He says for him, he even blamed God for the heavy burdens that he had to push. But Alan says that all that came crashing down when he was at a men's retreat. And at the retreat, they began it. One of the things they asked is, what do, you, what do you need from this? What are you wanting to get out of this? What do you want God to do for you and give you? And all of a sudden, it just came out. And Alan just wanted God's acceptance and approval. And his eyes were open to really what he had been relentlessly pursuing for most all of his life. He had this, just, this crushing weight on him that God never intended for him to bear that. God never intended for him to carry that, to boulder that, to all of the things that represented his brokenness and sin, for him to put it upon himself that he was going to have to push this and force this. It was a crushing weight that he couldn't carry. It was in that moment after years and years and years of ministry, already knowing Jesus as his Lord and Savior, he realized he was carrying things that Jesus had already taken care of at the cross. And it was in that moment that he drew out on paper two pictures. One, what he felt and he needed to let go, and the other that needed to be his new reality. And one was a picture of a man pushing a boulder, and the other was of the cross. And he knew what he needed to give give up was a performance-based living and expectation, and what he needed to embrace was the the grace-filled life. To acknowledge that Jesus had done for him what he could never do for himself. Jesus took that upon himself. In Isaiah 53, he was pierced for our rebellion. Jesus was crushed for iniquities. The punishment that should have been on us was on him. Jesus took that. And he was free, and he was accepted, and he was brought into the family, not based on his own performance, but based on Jesus and his righteousness. And Alan realized that his achievements would never be enough He wasn't going to be acceptable to God and others by his own doing. And so he put his hope in Jesus. Grace-based living. Relentless pushing can lead you to, to lose your footing. And when you slip, it comes crashing down. And you experience relational breakdowns. You experience personal burnout. And for Alan, this led to something that he was also not anticipating. He said because he lived his life, most all of his life like this, so many years of his life, it also led to osteoporosis for him. He said he was diagnosed with a stress fracture, which seemed odd, and his wife demanded that he have like this bone density test, which he did. And in the process, he discovered he had severe osteoporosis throughout much of his body. And when he was talking to the doctor about this, it was like what he had, typically you see in heavy smokers, drinkers, and postmenopausal octogenarians, none of which is what Alan was. But he later learned, and he said even the book, The Heart Math Solution, talks about this, that the stress hormone cortisol depletes calcium from the bones, and it can be a precursor to osteoporosis. Chronically elevated levels of cortisol have been shown to impair immune function, reduce glucose utilization, increase bone loss, promote osteoporosis, reduce muscle mass, inhibit skin growth and regeneration, increase fat accumulation, especially around the waist and hips. It can impair memory, hurt learning, destroy brain cells. And Alan was like, I was dealing with all of that. Like those were my symptoms. But it was at that minute the cross event when he said he really had that release from living his life for the acceptance and the approval of people, that he was constantly performing to receive it. Because it was there when those leading that retreat, as he began to share with them his personal struggle and his own awakening with this and all of the things of acceptance and approval that he was living for, the men that led the retreat did something for him. They, they laid a cross down because he shared with them his, his image of the cross and this boulder. They blindfolded him and laid him on the cross. They took stones and they wrote everything that he said that had caused that pressure to be upon him. And they laid the stones on him. As he lay on the cross, he could just feel the weight of them. And one by one, they took a stone off. 
And they talked about how that was no longer something he was to carry, that Christ had dealt with that. And they removed it. And then another guy would come and take one off and say he, he was not to carry that. Christ was going to do that. He said he was just sobbing and weeping as he laid on this cross, just feeling literally these burdens being lifted to Jesus, that Jesus would carry those on the cross, not him, not anymore. It was a powerful moment in his life. And Alan recalled the hymn by James Proctor, that's entitled, It Is Finished. And some of the words that gripped him were these, lay your deadly doing down, down at Jesus' feet. Stand in him alone, gloriously complete. And Alan said it was then to now that he understands at a deeper level than he ever has before. He is loved apart from what he does. He's accepted apart from how he performs. He is forgiven and blame-free apart from anything he deserves. And it's all because of what Christ has done for him. Everything comes back to what Christ did on the cross for him. And Jesus is declaring through faith that we are accepted to God. Through faith we're accepted to God. And his relentless pursuit of acceptance and approval, it was exhausting. And it was when he could identify the cause of his weariness that it was helpful to him. He found rest. What will you do? Is that it? Are you seeking acceptance and approval? Is it a relentless pursuit of hurry in business? Or perhaps it's this. Maybe you're just weary from the, the relentless circumstances that are happening to you. It, it's not just one thing. It seems to be the multiplications of things. And it might be through physical ailment and sickness, illness, disease, family crisis. It could be problems, sleeping. It could be emotional or spiritual attack. It could be, what do you do? What do you do when you feel tired and spent and bone deep? You feel it, the agonizing weariness that David felt. What do you do? Yes, it's good to lament. Yes, it's good to identify the cause and, and begin to bring about some changes in your life. But, but here's what I, I see in Psalm chapter 6. It's the most important thing to do. In fact, it's, it's really the thing we do first before we do anything else. And it's, it's this. It's good to take your weariness to the Lord. When you are weary, who do you go to first? Oftentimes, we will first go and express it to people who really are powerless to do anything about what we're feeling in that moment. But David does it right. He takes it to the Lord. He goes to God first. That's where he takes it, not to someone else. He takes it to the Lord. Some of you are not short on complaining, but you're short on complaining to the Lord. Some of you don't seem to have a problem lamenting. You're just not lamenting to the Lord, the one who can do something about it. Someone who is powerless to do it is who you're talking to. But David appeals to the Lord, and he appeals to God for two reasons. Number one, David says, for your unfailing love. David knows that he loves him, and so I'm appealing you to God because I know you love me, your unfailing love for me. But he's also doing it because he says, I know you want my praise, and how am I going to praise from the grave if I end up there? So God, I know you want this, and I know you want me. And so David begins crying out to him, just leaving his destiny in God's hands. It's in that moment that David abruptly switches gears in the psalm. He takes it to the Lord. He shares his laments. He openly declares them. But then all of a sudden, you see in the psalm that David openly declares that the Lord has heard his cry, that the Lord has accepted his prayer. And all of a sudden, this psalm, this lament, goes from despair to deliverance. It goes from anguish to that of victory, saying that, that God would overwhelm the enemies with shame and anguish. It just shows this reversal from grief to joy, distress to rest. And about a third of the other psalms are doing this as well. And here's the question, what, why the change of heart? What happened so fast? How did David recover his equilibrium from where he was in complete agony to suddenly a different perspective? How did it happen? Robert Johnston, in his commentary on the psalms for God's people, he says, David's transformation took place as the name of the Lord was spoken. It's because of who he went to. He went to the Lord. He took it to the Lord. He prayed, and the Lord lifted him up. When we come to the Lord, in due time he will. In fact, this is 1 Peter 5, 6 through 7. Humble yourselves before the Lord. Humble yourselves. Therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up 
in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. This is what's happening for David. As he's crying out to the Lord, the, the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit is ministering to him. He's caring for David in that moment. He's lifting him up. This is how it happens. And in that moment, David experiences it. But there's another reason. David's transformation from anguished petition to joyful praise was because he made a, a decisive choice that was rooted in faith. It was a decisive choice rooted in faith. I know God's unfailing love is real. I know God has done this before. I know that God can be trusted. And because of that, David gains energy knowing that God's promises and provision and his presence will be with him. That there is this choice to put his faith in the Lord in this moment of anguish. And even though David is writing this psalm and he's expressing things that he is personally feeling, the psalm is not written for just him individually. That's why we don't even know specifically his circumstances he's going through. The words that he does, like many of the psalms of lament, are not just for the individual, they're for the community. These psalms were sung in worship. Psalm 6 was used in worship of the Lord. And when we come together as community and we're worshiping the Lord together and we're expressing our, our grief and our burdens and our frustrations and our confusion and our pain to the Lord, we are also gaining faith from one another. We're encouraging each other. We're seeing a brother or a sister maintaining their faith in the Lord even, even during the hard times. It's why we gather. It's why we come together so we can encourage one another in this. And so the pattern that we see in David that is something we should use in worship where we go to God, we express honestly our needs and our frustrations as well as our trust, knowing that God is in command of every situation. And we can learn from other believers and experience joy. That's why we come together. And so we bring it to the Lord. We, we do it together so we're encouraged by one another. And so when someone says, man, how do you, how do you have hope? in the face of weariness. How do you have hope in the face of weariness? Well, let me share one final thing. It's all about the one to whom you bring your weariness. Like Jesus said it this way, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me. And you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me. You'll learn to live freely and lightly. Jesus would say, come to me. He invites all of us to take up the easy yoke, the easy way to shoulder the weight of life with love and joy and peace. Jesus had so much joy to give, but are we going to him to let him resolve our weariness? Jesus says, come to me. The author of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3 would say this. Don't just come to Jesus, consider Jesus. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Think deeply on Jesus. Go to Jesus, consider him. Think deeply on him so that you won't grow weary, because the life of Jesus will inspire you. The Spirit of Jesus will dwell in you. The power of Jesus will come into you. His presence will go before you. He's for you. He's with you. You dwell on Jesus. Think on Him, so you don't grow weary. So what do we do when we're weary? We come to Jesus, and we consider Jesus. That's what we do. That's the solution to our weariness. Come to Jesus. Come to Him with all of your laments and your grief. And then consider Jesus. You dwell and you think on him. And when we do that, he overcomes our weariness. Corey Tim Boone, she said it this way. She said, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. Absolutely you will. If you're the kind of person that like watches news like every day, like multiple times, you're messed up right now. I'm just going to tell you that. Because all algorithms of news lead you to get messed up. I mean, that's how it works. And you just are. I mean, your, your whole filter of everything in life is so discouraged and down and just, you, you, can't, you can't even handle it. You feel like, you know, we, we're, we're hopeless. And Jesus is coming to you to say, no, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, the solution is not to look in here, you'll be depressed. But if you look at Christ, you'll be at rest. You look at Christ, you go to him and you'll be at rest. That's a promise. Our rest 
Our hope, it's found in Jesus. He brings it. He gives it. Take your lament to Jesus. Surrender your life to Jesus. You believe in Jesus. You confess your sins to Jesus. You confess your, your heartache and your grief and your frustrations to Jesus. You repent and you turn to Jesus. You be baptized into Christ and you live for Jesus. We bring it to Jesus. That's where we find rest for our souls. That's where we find rest for our hearts. That's where, that's where we find rest for our being, for our body, for everything, the wholeness of it all. It's all found in Jesus. And so, Lord, we just want to pray today, God, as we bring our hurts and our frustrations and our anger and our disappointments, and we bring it all to you right now. Because, Jesus, only you can carry the weight of it. Only you can handle it. Only you can deal with it and remove it or give us strength and resolve through it. Only you. And so, Jesus, we come to you. We cry out to you. We believe in you. We need you. You hold the words of life. You give us everything we need for life and for godliness. You're the one that goes before us and never leaves us or forsakes us. Lord, you can empower us today and make us new and renew in us a clean heart, a right spirit. You can lift us up on wings as eagles so we can soar. You can lift up our countenance. Lord, you can remind us that you care for us as we cast our cares on you. You can do this. You do what no one else can do. That's why we come to you. To whom else would we go? And so Jesus, we come to you today and pray for rest and healing and hope and help. We bring the laments to you. God, we want to be honest and, and find out why are we experiencing what we're experiencing, living the way we're living? Why are we so weary and tired and broken and deep bone tired? Jesus, we bring all of that to you, putting our hope and faith in you. We come to you and we consider you so that we don't grow weary and lose heart. We don't want to be weary in loving you. We don't want to be weary in living for you. We don't want to be weary in doing good. So Lord, we pray you fill us for your purpose and your will. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. As you stand to your feet this morning, so our prayer team is going to be here on the side of the room. And I just want to encourage you today uh, to, to go let someone pray for you today. Now, they're here to pray with you down on the side, towards the front, the sides of the room. They want to pray with you. And I want to encourage you because it's in prayer that God moves powerfully. So as we sing this song, lifting our hearts to the Lord. Let's do this together. And today, if you want to begin a relationship with Jesus, you want to follow Jesus, uh, I would love to have a conversation with you today. I'll be right over here at Decision Point through these double doors. Of course, you can use the connection card in the seat in front of you or the information that's on the screen, but we'd love to follow up with you today as we lift our voices to the Lord. Let's sing together.